So we're already pushing up into this very high range area where millions is not crazy. It's actually very attainable. I bumped into Lawrence Lippard at the conference and、uh, he was saying, Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about your one million prediction and、uh, I'm starting to see it now. It's looking very possible. Because it is very possible. It's just、mm-hmm. cognitively, it's difficult for us to process what it means for Bitcoin to be a million dollars a coin because、mm-hmm. that's very far away from where we are now. But if you look at it in terms of multiples, it's not. It's a 10x from 100K. Or at 300K, it's just a 3x and change. And Bitcoin does these. Doubles and triples quite often. If you look at all the pieces of the puzzle that are laid in front of us, it just shows that there's not a lot of Bitcoin to buy. Nobody's selling.、Mm-hmm. Most of us are at the point at which we've reached the conclusion like, sell for what? If I need a house, maybe I would sell something, but I don't. And a lot of us are very low time preference, so we're not looking for a Lambo or something. We're here for change. And for us, Bitcoin is the end game. Samson Mo, the CEO of Pixelmatic and Jan3, has given us his latest predictions about Bitcoin's price and its chance for mass global adoption. According to him, a million dollars per coin is very attainable shortly. And the potential for a sudden and substantial increase in the price of Bitcoin should not be underestimated. Using historical examples, he reminds investors of the rapid price movements in the previous bull runs in the Bitcoin market. Samson also believes that most holders have reached a point where they see little incentive to sell, unless faced with a significant need, such as purchasing a house. Many Bitcoin holders prefer a low time preference, prioritizing long term value over short term gains, like buying luxury items. Instead, they are invested in Bitcoin for its potential to bring about systemic change. For these individuals, Bitcoin is not only an investment, it's their end game. We will now bring you more clips of Samson Mo as he shares his insights about hyperbitcoinalization. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel to show your support. Thanks and enjoy. Well, there's a number of factors at play here. Like, we're at 900 coins produced a day, it's going to drop to 450. There's about 1.2, 1.3 million coins sloshing around on the exchanges. And you have about. I don't know, 6,000 coins demand per day now, per trading day. If you,、uh, figure, if you look at all the pieces of the puzzle that are laid in front of us, it just shows that there's not a lot of Bitcoin to buy. Nobody's selling.、Mm-hmm. Most of us are at the point at which we've reached the conclusion like, sell for what? If I need a house, maybe I would sell something, but I don't. And a lot of us are. Very low time preference, so we're not looking for a Lambo or something. We're here for change. And for us, Bitcoin is the end game. It's not about investing in Bitcoin to cash out. So, how many sellers are there? I don't really know.、Yeah. Some people will sell, they'll probably sell at 100K, but they're going to buy back when it keeps going up to 200K. Maybe some people will sell at、uh, half a million. And they buy back in at 750 because it's still going up. And at the same time, this is all playing out with ETFs. We're working to get nation states on board to buy Bitcoin. Nation states are already mining Bitcoin. So, one million is just an easy target, in my view. Buying actual Bitcoin, holding actual Bitcoin, I think is a more difficult thing. So, what we might actually see is nation state adoption of Bitcoin through ETF buying because it's so easy for them to do. It's already. Structured and lined up. They just have to push a button. So we'll see. But we know for a fact that countries do want hard assets. That's why they've been buying gold for the past、mm-hmm. tw- few decades and accumulating. Except for Canada, we sold all the gold. But <laughs> countries with some foresight and with some planning are trying to accumulate hard assets. And with the、uh, The effect of、uh, US seizure of Russian funds in the central bank, it kind of sends a signal that the dollar is not a functional reserve currency anymore because they're just IOUs that anyone can freeze and remove from your possession at any given time. So you're going to see more hard assets being sought out, which will be gold because they know gold, gold is old. 
and they're going to go into Bitcoin as Bitcoin becomes more expensive. Because as it becomes more expensive, it becomes more valuable in their eyes. Well, if you think about it, this is separating money from state. Getting governments uh, to mine Bitcoin or to have a Bitcoin strategy is them willingly separating money from state. Because you cannot embrace Bitcoin and still embrace the money printer. They're opposite things. And I think uh, this strategy is lost on a lot of Bitcoiners. They think, well, I'll just buy Bitcoin and uh, I'll hodl Bitcoin and eventually the state will go away. But I don't think that's going to be the case. The state will exist in some form or other for some time, at least for the foreseeable future. But the best thing we can do is to give them Bitcoin. Not literally give, but imbue them with Bitcoin and hopefully the characteristics and ethos of Bitcoin will permeate the government. Governments are largely made up of people and people can be influenced for the better. And I think Bitcoin does change people and make them better human beings overall, um, lowering their time preference, making them understand the value of property rights. And this is really a way for us to bring about the uh, Bitcoin promise land or the Bitcoin revolution is changing the, the governments and the people in the governments to be Bitcoiners. And I think this is the, the way that we end up with a, a separation, a full separation of money and state, which is the state just accepts Bitcoin or they're mining Bitcoin and they no longer print money. And if they're accepting Bitcoin, they're a part of the Bitcoin network as a peer, just like you or I. And they're no different or special anymore. So it starts with a simple conversation. Um, we try to align their goals with Bitcoin. Essentially, how Bitcoin works is alignment of incentives of different parties. There's no coercion involved. There's no you know, legal structure or anything like that. It's all about incentives. And we try to do the same with nation states. Um, does a given country want to tap into energy reserves that they have that are not used? Bitcoin can help with that. Do they have environmental goals like reducing uh, flare gas, uh, methane from landfills? Bitcoin can help with that. Or do they want to stimulate their economy, bring in investment in tourism? Bitcoin can help with that. So we try to approach it from a very positive, constructive angle about how Bitcoin can help them with what their current goals are. It's not that we go in and say, you know, Bitcoin is sound money. You have to lower your time preference. You need to uh, embrace uh, hard money and uh, stop printing money. It's not the way to reach them, I believe. It's more about coming at them as an ally and educating them on what Bitcoin is and what the potential... Bitcoin could do for them and for their country. Samson argues that nation states increasingly turn to Bitcoin to separate money from state control. He believes that Bitcoin adoption will positively impact governance, leading to better governments that respect property rights more. Due to its nature as a decentralized and scarce digital asset, Bitcoin imbues governments with an understanding of sound money and self-sovereignty. Samson emphasizes that embracing Bitcoin and continuing with fiat money printing are incompatible. He notes that while some Bitcoin enthusiasts may hope for the eventual demise of the state through widespread Bitcoin adoption, he believes that governments will likely persist in some form for the foreseeable future. Here are more insights from Samson Mo as he explains his points. Necessity is the mother of Bitcoin adoption. The countries that are more likely to do something with Bitcoin are the ones that need it the most. Western countries often are in what they believe to be a decent position, and they're more concerned about, about protecting what they have than for growing and economic growth and prosperity. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's different perspectives on how they fit into the world today. I would say countries in the global south specifically in Latin America, they very much want growth. Um, and this is, I think, a driver for El Salvador. They really wanted to lift themselves out of this hole that they've been put into 
both uh, economically and in terms of safety and security, right? It was the murder capital of the world. And now it's a tourist destination where people bring their families. So they, they implemented a Bitcoin strategy, I would say, out of necessity and also for prosperity. So they wanted to get rid of debt not be uh, bound to the IMF indefinitely. And other countries in LATAM are the same. They want some way out and they want to become prosperous. So Bitcoin is an avenue for them to achieve that end. But I don't think... BRICS wants to make their own currency. Right. But I don't think that will work for the same reasons why the US dollar is not working. Because a currency made by BRICS has to mean that they all trust each other and... That's a very difficult thing to do when the geopolitics of the world is shifting all the time. I just don't think they can maintain a, a, a BRICS currency. Argentina is interesting. They took a different path than El Salvador. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Michael Saylor's take on that. I find in private conversation he's very negative about the world and you know, I'm very hopeful. I, I thought Malay was going to win, but he didn't. I also think... Uh, Bobby Kennedy is going to win. I don't know what he thinks, but a lot of people don't see it coming. But what this all means is that people are getting tired of the old system where nothing, everything changes but doesn't change. And this is why Malay can win, because people are genuinely tired of the rut that they're stuck in. And they really want things to be fixed. Because Malay should not have won by any means. He's not a real contender if you look at the political landscape. But he won. But anyways, going back to your point, he's effectively taken his own path, a more libertarian path, and it's just as valid as El Salvador Bitcoin legal tender path. So his path is deregulation of money. You can use whatever money you choose to, as long as you all agree. And that, for me, is just as good as legal tender of Bitcoin, because you can already use Bitcoin there, and they are implicitly encouraging um, people to form contracts. Uh, their foreign minister, Diana, has said publicly, you know, you can use Bitcoin or cows or, or milk to trade. So that is good. A free market is good. Bitcoin is free market money. So while countries can do legal tender, deregulation might actually be the easier way to go forward if you have a libertarian at the helm. But still, it's challenging to get a libertarian or a Bitcoiner president. Yeah. The path that El Salvador took is valuable still because while they maintain Bitcoin as legal tender, that makes Bitcoin a foreign currency, which allows us at Jan3 to pursue novel approaches with other countries that have ways to embrace foreign currency as their own currency. So that gives us the chance to work with uh, Guatemala. And they just simply say, they simply acknowledge Bitcoin as a foreign currency. These are facts. There's no need for legislation. Um, in Suriname, they have executive orders that allow the local population to use dollars and euros along with the SRD, their local currency. And they can do the same for Bitcoin because it is a foreign currency. So all of these things give us opportunities to push for more Bitcoin adoption around the world. Are you holding on to Bitcoin as your end game, or is it just another investment opportunity? Share your thoughts in the comments section. If you found today's video informative and would like more insights and updates on cryptocurrency and global finance, please consider liking the video, subscribing to our channel, and enabling post notifications. Stay tuned for our next episode, where we'll uncover more about the fascinating developments in the crypto space. Until then, keep questioning, keep exploring, and most importantly, keep investing wisely. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.